All right, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. I'm super excited for today's video. I'm here with Saf. Uh, we literally just met today for the first time. We connected on Instagram about two weeks ago. We're both in the digital marketing space. We both happen to run agencies and do very similar things um, in the online marketing world. And Saf today, guys, is gonna talk to you about how he runs his digital marketing agency with a team of over, what is it, eight people? Eight people. So about eight team members, and they do about 30K a month in recurring revenue. How long have you guys been running the agency? Um, this agency, only a couple of months. Sweet. But you've been in the space for a long time. Yeah, we'll get into your story. Time. and yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, again, guys, if you're new here on the channel, uh, click the like button below, but also more importantly, hit the subscribe button and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out on all the new content and training that is coming out over the next few weeks and months. With that out of the way, let's get into Saf's story. So, bro, let's just start with like your story. Just tell everyone, just kind of like, you start giving away as much as you want. And we'll go from there. Cool. So I actually started um, my career in sales and marketing uh, a very long time ago. Um, I've been in this space for about five plus years now. Um, I started doing it quite formally through formal education. So I studied um, at Leeds University doing uh, marketing in my undergraduate, then went off to work in sales and recruitment, then went to do my master's. Um, I also got a job in marketing, worked my way up to the head of marketing and sales for a, a leisure company generating millions of pounds of revenue every year. Um, and then decided that I was gonna make the shift really to, to move over to digital agency myself mm. um, and take that kind of <coughs> marketing stronghold and my kind of expertise partnered with the, the theoretical knowledge that I had, apply them both together and create an agency in, in the north of England. Dude, that's awesome, man. I think what's really cool, guys, is like, most people that hear about starting a digital marketing agency, they hear about it and the path is very much just like, kind of ragtag. Like mm -hmm. you don't need a dig uh, uh, you don't need a formal education. A lot of people will just kind of take a few courses online and go out and make it happen. And they definitely can, but I think your story is cool because you did kind of go down yeah. the traditional route. You did go through the education system, but you're still doing your own thing and it's really cool to see. So um, this is gonna be a great story and great experiences for you guys to hear about. I guess one question is, how did you even like want to get into marketing in the first place? Because um, you, you did a bunch of studying, but like yeah. what made you want to go down that uh, path? Uh, to, to be honest, I was already interested in the idea of, of business selling, um, trying to understand people's psyche and how psychology and business almost overlap and kind of meet. Yeah, so um, I think that's what kind of interested me. And then also the actual earning potential within that industry, it was just enormous really, it's uncapped. And there's always gonna be businesses needing other services, whether one company is doing better than another or one industry is doing better than another. There's always gonna be a need for marketing. So what was the transition like from, cause you went from studying marketing yeah. and then what happened after you finished school? Um, so after I finished, I, I kind of worked in this high end job in Central Leeds my first day at work, I went up in this glass elevator. By the way, Leeds is a place in the UK. It, yeah, so it's in the north of England. Cool. I uh, went up in this glass elevator and told I was gonna get a, a, a tailored suit for my gift. Um, it was everything that I thought I wanted. Um, mm. And at that point in time, it probably was mm. what I wanted. Uh, a couple of weeks in, I quickly realized it wasn't for me. Um, the big corporate game, the rat race, the staying up on nights, chasing numbers, um, the hustle, was there, the grind was there, but it was to put money in someone else's pocket, not mine. Um, and that was a big kind of motivating factor to decide, actually, I'm gonna take things under my own impressions and be in control of my life. Um, that's why I decided to take the leap eventually to, to working for myself. Dude, that's awesome. So how long were you working in the corporate world and working for someone else doing marketing before you want to go off on your own? Um, so initially I was working in a company for about six months. Um, the money was amazing. The commissions, bonuses and everything else was great. But I decided that wasn't the right thing to pursue. So I left that to then go studying again to do my masters, mm. as well as that I also got a job uh, in a different company, which was great to work for, uh, took a massive pay cut. Uh, and the lesson I kind of took from that was it's always worth following something that you're really passionate about regardless of the money. And then it kind of naturally progressed into, actually, I'm gonna do my own thing. Mm. I'm gonna start working for myself. What I was doing for my employer at the time, as much as I enjoyed working there, um, 
this was now about me. This was about me putting my kind of skill set to use, um, starting my own agency, ground up with the knowledge and expertise that I had, both th theoretically through what I'd learned at university and through what I'd learned through application mm. and, and marrying those two things up. Dude, that is so cool. I think like the biggest, the, the biggest takeaway from what mm. you just said was, guys, like doing something that you make a lot of money from but you don't genuinely enjoy. Like people talk about that all the time. Like yeah. chase your passion, chase the thing that you enjoy, but you've lived it. Yeah. Like you've seen the other side of doing something where you make a fucking shit ton of money. Mm -hmm. Like the money's good, but you realize, it probably didn't take you that long to realize there's just more. It was literally a couple of months. And I think the, the, the big thing that I didn't even realize at the time, which became apparent looking back on it, mm -hmm. was whilst you might be happy with a certain amount of money, you could literally chase your passion and earn so much more. Now I'm earning even more than I was back then. And I, I didn't even know that was possible. So it, it just goes to show, like I would advise anyone who's, who's looking to kind of progress into some kind of passion, as long as it's viable and as long as there's a need for it and as long as you're good enough for it, if you commit to it, I think there's an outcome there. 100% man, I agree. So talk to us all about like, you decide, you know what, don't wanna work for someone anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going on my own, what happens next? Um, so at this point in my life, I was actually staying at home. Um, I speak to my mum about it, uh, who I'm living with at the time, just me and her. And she says to me, I don't think this is a good idea. Mm. Not because I don't believe in what you're doing, we just have bills to pay and that's the reality of it. And that's often the things that comes up when people talk about chasing your passion. So people wanna do art, but the backlash is always, is there enough money in it to be sustainable? And whilst you don't need to chase the money, it's a sad reality that money does give you a certain amount of freedom in this world. For and sure. It, you do need it to kind of sustain yourself and, <clears throat> and, and to live. Um, that was something which, came, uh, which became apparent. So my mom saying to me, don't do this. We've got bills to pay and it's a big risk working for yourself. So I decide, okay, well, let's come to some kind of compromise because I really want to commit to this. So she says, okay, if I give you a week, do you think you can close one client just, just so it's a proven concept? Mm. And I go, okay, cool. Uh, within half an hour, I ring through to some of the people that I'd worked with previously. I tell them my situation, my kind of story, my background, and I say, I'm looking to work for myself. You've used me for services in the past. Would you be open to working on a six month basis? Because I need that foresight to be able to see that I can plan my income for the next six months. Mm. And literally the first person that I called said, name a price, told him, very low. And they go, yeah, we'd love to. Wow. And it was like, wow. Like that, that, that whole situation, that whole worry that I'd built up was, was my own limited beliefs. Next call, same thing. How did you feel in that moment when the client or the former colleague or whatever agreed to be a client? Um, to be fair, I was more surprised than anything else mm. because in the back of my mind, whilst I wanted to do this and whilst I believed it was true, I was ready for them to say no. Mm. I was ready for them to say no. When it happened once and I was like, whoa, wait, what? And then it happens again and again. Then I go into work, put in my notice, and I'm like, well, this is, this is now a proven concept. So I think if you're gonna pursue anything, all you need to do first at step one is just to make sure it's a proven concept. Mm. As long as it's a proven concept, then you can scale it. Then you can make sure you, you, you leave your job, but you don't leave your job and then decide to open up a marketing agency. You state your job and you open up a marketing agency. You give up your social hours, your weekends, your evenings, your sleep, your breakfast, you commit wholeheartedly first whilst you've still got your job. And once it's a proven concept, then you can say, okay, the rest of the hours that I'm doing at work, it would be more beneficial financially to commit those hours into my business. Bro, that's so, so, so good. Like we talk about that all the time with clients. Mm -hmm. They'll come in and be like, so should I quit my job now? It's like, no, 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 no. Cause you did the same thing. I did the same thing mm -hmm. when I was working in sales back in 2017, like I, was still working and I was cold calling in the back office. Like I started the agency while I was mm. at the job and I only left after I knew I had something going at yeah. some level of traction. Even if it's like 
a little bit, still have something, something to pull on, something that shows you there is some light there. Because, mm -hmm. um, dude, that's gold advice. Because a mistake a lot of people make is they leave the job and then they have nothing and then they're stuck with nothing. Mm -hmm. And when you have zero money coming in, it's very hard because you, then you're kind of operating out of a place of just desperation yeah. and necessity. Or not necessity, but because you need to have that feeling of necessity, but more desperation and fear is probably the, the mm -hmm. best way to describe it. So that's really good. Um, okay, so you, had the, you got those first few clients, yeah. and then what happened next? Um, at that point, it was literally, okay, I've got myself a proven concept. I've got this thing which works. All I need to do is focus on three things. Is it economic? Is it efficient? Is it effective? When we can say that all three of those things are hit to 100%, then we can say our business is optimal. That's when we're going to be making the most amount of money. But right now, at that moment in time, it wasn't. Mm. So we didn't have any systems in place. I didn't have any proper contracts written. It wasn't legally sound financially. Like there was things I needed to tweak, people I need to speak about. That's all I need to do. Step two, make it efficient, make it effective, make it economic. Mm. Um, and from there onwards, you just keep turning the keep turning the, the levels up. So, okay, fair enough. My, my first client, I wasn't charging enough. Like, let's just make another call, just like I did with them to someone else, and charge 25% more. And if they say yes, next person, 25% more. Next person, 25%. Now I need to speak to the first client, your retainer's ending, we can renew it, but look, it's I'm, this. I'm, I'm, I'm at a different level now. Mm. Like, you, if you want my time, you have to pay what other people are paying. Mm. Um, and that, that's about making it effective. Efficiency is things like systems, processes. Um, are we duplicating work anywhere? Um, how am I actually acquiring customers? Is it even cost beneficial for me to acquire them in that certain way? Because if it's spending a lot of my time, it might not even be worth having those. Next thing I learned straight away, don't have bad customers because they cost your business time. They cost your business money and resources, right? So true. We'd have all our clients, all our customers, and 20% of them would be responsible for 80% of our earnings. And there'd also be the flip side where 20% of them would be a different 20%. Our most problematic customers, they take the most staffing out of us, they pay us late, um, they're more problematic than anybody else, they've got more complaints than anybody else. Just cut them off. Just cut them off. Because that's not efficient. 100%, man. Um, and then, as, as long as you keep focusing on those three things, like you, you're destined for growth, it's progress. So spot on. So how can the people that are watching this, how can they avoid dealing with problem clients? Because I talk about that a lot as well. It's like, we, we were actually talking about that earlier. Like, yeah. don't bother with headache clients. So what should people look out for? What is What are the red flags of a headache client so that you cannot even bother going down that path? Um, I think this is where it's really valuable for you to be able to prospect your clients in, in, in some kind of setting where you're able to get some degree of body language from them. Mm. Because if you're just doing things over the phone or just doing things via email, for example, um, you might miss out on those cues. And those cues are, are often quite physical telltales. So um, particularly when you're discussing things like price, um, your service offering or scope of work or whatever you want to call it, um, seeing that person's response um, can be big indicators straight off the bat. So we're talking like meeting one, meeting two, like you're seeing things very, very, very quickly. Mm. Um, but also, second to that is, is your website, is your Instagram, is your whatever acquisition method you have, is that built to a system where you're gonna filter those people out so they don't even contact you? If your Instagram or your website looks so good that people are scared to object with you, you're doing something right. Mm. If the content that you're putting out is so amazing that people aren't going to contact you if they're terrible, picky clients, good for you. You're doing something right. Um, other telltale signs can be things like payments being made late. Um, that's always a big one. Never Massive. settle for it. Never settle for it. Um, also, people um, wanting you to do what they've always done. Because if you do what they've always done, you're probably going to get the same results they've always had. And Boom. if they want you to get the same results, they want to call you in. Correct. 
Um, so you have to position yourself not as a worker for that company, but as, as, as an expert. And you partner side by side with the lead marketing manager or the directors or whoever it is to align with their business goals, but you're the expert. You're the expert and you have to do that from get go. Mm. Um, if in meeting one, you're um, literally doing everything they say, you're setting the tone, like you need to be running things on, on your record. 100%, guys, that is massive. Position yourself as the consultant, as the trusted advisor, almost. Um, not as, like you said, dude, not yeah. as just like an employee, not someone who they're hiring yeah. as a freelancer, just working for them. Um, dude, that's such good stuff, guys. I'm excited for getting this out to you. Um, dude, let's talk about growth. Yeah. People are always like, how do I grow the agency? How do I get more clients, more meetings, more, more, more? What are you guys doing? What have you guys done that's worked really well in that regard? Um, so firstly, um, actually growing your team. Mm. Um, I'm a big believer in finding yourself to the point where you feel like you're gonna drown or you're gonna overspill and then staying at least three months at that point. Mm. So not saying we're full, let's hire. It should be we're full, let's see if we can sustain this at mm. least for three months. Because often we find that over the space of a, a yearly quarter, things change. If you find that things are still at the same level, that market's still got opportunity for you. You still need to be putting in more people. Um, either those are people who are gonna prospect more for you or they're gonna be subcontractors for the work that you deliver or whatever that might be in, in the agency setting. Um, also, growth comes in so many different forms. Training. Um, how often do we invest in ourselves and our people mm. before we even think about the softwares that we're gonna buy? Um, how often do we take time to reflect on things? Mm. Um, I'm a big believer in being able to measure growth by numbers. Mm. So not just clients, not just revenue, but also things like conversion rates. Do we track conversion rates in our business? Um, do we understand which channels are most effective? Mm. Are we putting this either into a software or Excel sheet or however you want to do it, it needs to be logged. Um, as marketing experts going into businesses, speaking to people about what they should and shouldn't do, we'd be surprised how many people in our space don't take our own marketing seriously. Um, and it is largely a numbers game. Largely 100%, a numbers game. Man. Um, do we know how much it costs us to acquire a customer? Do we know what our customer lifetime value is? How many times do we ask our clients but we don't often know ourselves? Mm. Um, and being introspective will really give you the numbers to be able to identify things. Um, and if we don't know how to, how to, for example, work out what our client acquisition rate is or our cost to acquire a client, that's step one. Let's just work it out. How do we work it out? And there's just so much content online that we'll, we, can, we can learn this thing quite easily. So I, I'd say the, the, the key to growth is firstly being able to look introspectively on your own agency to be able to define things because if you're not at that point where you know the numbers, you can't tell if you've grown or not. Spot on, bro, spot on. Um, okay, so what do you guys do in the way of, like, because a lot of people that are watching this mm -hmm. are probably curious, how can I get more people interested in my services, more appointments, more uh, meetings on my calendar? Because mm -hmm. we talked about that uh, earlier today. Yeah, what are you so, guys doing? Um, we're, we're actually trialing something very different right now. Um, we're, we're pretty much innovating the whole kind of sales journey. Um, and we're really going after referrals. Mm. So just looking at the numbers again, we realize that cold calling, sending out cold emails, looms, all those kind of things, they work. I'm not saying that they don't work, but it is largely a numbers game. It's about volume. So we're looking at appealing to the masses, sending out our message, getting some conversions to first meetings, some conversions to second, some to close. What we're trialing now is a completely redefined idea of trying to acquire clients. And we're doing that through trying to get as quality leads as possible, which we found the best method to be referrals. How are we getting referrals? Simple. We're asking people for them, but we've taken it to a science. Okay, hold on. So guys, before we get into the next part, because this is exactly what we were talking about over lunch earlier. This stuff is so good. It's so, so, so good. Um, there's very few people who I've met that actually talk about 
what SAP is about to get into because it's it's not just it is getting referrals and landing more clients, but it also ties directly into the customer experience and the customer journey that their clients experience when they come in and start working with them. Um, so, let's go. So the first thing we realized was referrals are largely based on the experience that clients have with us. And there's two sides to that. So one is obviously the logical rational side of your brain, which goes, we've spent X with them, we've got a certain amount of customers, we've got a certain amount of leads. But then there's another side which nobody speaks about. And that's the side we're focusing on. That's the relationship side. You can have some kind of emotional involvement with your marketing agency, because at the end of the day, there's no such thing as B2B, it's always going to be person to person, right? Boom, there's no such thing as B2B, it's always person to person, it's so good. Um, So what we try and do now is we map out the emotional journey as well as the metric KPIs that we have for our clients. So we say, for example, um, where would you like to be within six months time? And they might say, we want to um, double our revenue. So we say, okay, what would that mean to you? Mm. They say, oh, well, we'll have this much more money. No, no, no. What does that mean to you? Um, it means that I have to work less. What does that mean to you? I get more time with my family. What does that mean to you? I'd be happier. So if I could get double the revenue in six months, you'd be happier. Yes. That's what we're looking for. What we're looking for is some kind of commitment, emotional commitment from our clients. So they say, yeah, I'd be happier if you were able to do this. So what we do on our side is we try and map that out. We try and understand where we want them to be and we try and understand what it means to our clients on a personal level, Mm. right? Now, we don't ask for referrals at the start. We don't ask for referrals at the end when most people do. Mm. We ask for referrals at the point that our client is at their most emotionally heightened state. Bingo. That's the key, Mm. right? Because they're most likely to give you the best referrals. They're most likely to be completely honest with you. And they're most likely to rave about you. So just in the example that I give, if my client wanted to double revenue in six months, we were able to do that in six months. In six months time, I give them a call and I say, hey, you will never guess what we've done. We've not just doubled your revenue, we've given you the chance to spend more time with your son, and as a gift, we've got you X. By the way, do you know anyone else who might be able to help? Wait, talk about the gift thing. Yeah. Guys, this is gold, this is so good. We found that giving referral fees, like most agencies do, doesn't have any intrinsic value apart from the money. And money is ultimately a number. Yeah, it's an IOU for goods and services, holds no emotional weight. Mm. But we've just been talking about things being quite emotional, right? So what we've done instead of the money is replace that cost that we'd give to a customer for a referral fee and replace it with a gift. And we make each of our gifts specific to the person. So part of our onboarding journey, part of our whole sales journey, we have a CRM system where we learn about and log everything we know about the customer. Mm. So we might, for example, on a call learn that someone's a certain sports fan, or they're into theatre, or they've got a certain amount of kids, or their birthday's on a certain day, whatever that might be, goes into our CRM. And then when we give our referral fee, which is now a gift, it's not a referral fee, we give that gift straight out. Mm. When we hit that milestone that they're at their happiest, They don't just get a call from us, a courtesy call. They don't just get, you know, congratulations, we've we've hit your six month mark. They get a gift from us that they're not expecting in any kind of way. It's super personal to them. And then the referral question happens. So you're getting them at an emotional high, reminding them why they're at an emotional high, and then giving them an even more emotional high by giving them a gift. Yeah. Then you ask for the referral. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Amazing, how has it been working for you guys? The referrals that we're getting are such good quality that it's probably best for us to spend time finding the right gift for someone than it is to be prospecting cold calls. Dude, that's amazing. It's magic. Magic, bro. 
Mm -hmm. What are some examples of gifts you've given to clients? Um, so we realized that one of our clients was um, a, a, a soccer fan. <laughs> Um, and they supported a certain team, Manchester United. So what we do is we get tickets to the game. This client was over the moon, do you know what I mean? Did not expect Probably it. lost their mind. They've literally just mentioned this on a call to, to one of our people who's just taken the call as normal, logged it into the CRM without them even remembering. They've, they've, they've been like, how did you know I love this team? Um, we've also given theatre tickets, like I said. Uh, the most peculiar one we did was um, we gave like a, a, a pamper day to somebody's dog to send their dog to a dog hotel because the dog meant so much to her. That's so good though. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is it's not just a box of chocolates. It's not just some flowers. It's not just a thank you card. It is genuinely thought out. The question always comes, is it financially viable? Yes because it's saving us staff hours trying to prospect referrals which don't convert. Mm. And the cost that we'd normally give as a referral fee, we're redirecting that in, in, in the form of a gift. Now there's no other agency out there which is gonna work with that company and be able to give them that kind of a gift on that kind of personal level. And that alone is what's gonna separate you. Mm -hmm. And that's not even, we haven't even talked about like what type of services you provide and results mm -hmm. and stuff, which that also could separate you. But mm -hmm. that one thing alone, guys, that's massive. So mm -hmm. good, bro, thank you for sharing this stuff. No problem. Um, let's talk about services. Everyone, most people are always curious, like what services you know, do just so and so offer for their agency? Should I productize my service? Should I niche down my service? Mm -hmm. Should I only offer one thing, five things, ten things? What should I do in that regard? So, what do you guys do? Um, we only focus on things that we have an expertise in, mm. only. So, even if that means that someone else in my team has a certain expertise, we will add that to a service list. However, if we aren't the people to do YouTube ads, we're not just going to add it on for the sake of adding mm. it on. Um, a big thing for us is that clients trust us long term. So if we say no to certain things, if they say, oh, we'd really want to try YouTube ads, and we say, look, I understand that, we just don't do it because we're not very good at it. That subconsciously in their mind says, they do Facebook ads because they are good at it. Um, saying no is such a valuable skill. Bro, that's so important because people trust you more when you admit you're not good at something. Yeah. Like, Think about the last time you talked to someone who wanted to sell you one thing and you asked them, hey, do you do these other things? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I do all of it. Mm -hmm. mm, then you must not be very good yeah. at each one because you can't, you can't trust that. So that's so, so, so good. Mm -hmm. um, so give some examples of the services that you guys do provide. So we do things like Facebook ads, for example, which is nowadays quite a staple thing. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, we also do things like branding, content creation, um, we also do um, Google Ads, for example. Um, we do things like website build. Um, we do things like reporting because I realize that there's a space where the first thing that clients realize is they don't know their numbers. Mm. And most agencies go, yeah, that's fine. We'll just do, we'll do what we need to do. You need to mm. do Facebook Ads. Whereas the first thing that we do is, okay, well, you need to take on a reporting package because you need to understand your numbers first and foremost. Secondly, that will hold us accountable because you'll be able to see whether we make a difference or not. Mm. Um, and thirdly, if you don't have the numbers behind you, you don't have a strategy in place. You can't possibly have one. So then we sell them strategy. Um, the, the, the whole point is that we start ground up um, and every service is interlinked with another service um, or as people might want to call it, omni-channel marketing. Um, for sure so omnipresence type thing. yeah 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 so we're, we're we understand now that that marketing works in like a 360 version right everything's linked to something else which it's not is just linear to something else yeah exactly 100 percent, dude this is awesome stuff let's wrap this up with three pieces of advice mm -hmm. to everybody watching this right now okay three things that every agency owner must know, or just any three pieces of advice you would give to people who are either just starting out in the early phases, maybe they've been doing it six months, a year plus, they, they're stuck, they can't figure out how to grow, mm -hmm. give it to them. Um, this is on the spot, by the way, I'm putting you super, super <laughs> on right. the spot. Uh, the first thing I'd say is a 
fool with this strategy can be a wise man without one. Oof. Um, always have a strategy. Mm. And it's not enough to have a strategy in your mind. It's not enough to have a broader kind of vision. You need to have that strategy written down. It needs to be systematic. It needs to have everything in there. Mm. Where do you want to go? How will we know when we're there? What will we have to do? Why are we doing it? How will we know when we're there is a huge one. Because mm. most people have no clarity on knowing, okay, we've actually hit something or we've reached somewhere. Yeah. They just keep going. Uh, for, for, for most people, it's either an, a certain number of clients that they want or it's a certain revenue target that they have. But are they on their top? Are they on top of their numbers enough to, to know, for example, um, how many employees will I need to be able to do that? How many mm. clients will I be able will I need to be able to do that? Um, what will my overheads look like at that point? Um, am I able to forecast these things financially? Uh, will I need certain premises? Will I need certain kind of client management tools? Am I able to take on that workload? Is it even possible? All those kinds of things you need to have considered be before you even get to that point. Um, and that's where we go back to the thing of metrics, knowing your numbers inside out, top down, all the way through, thorough and thorough, you need to know your numbers. Absolutely, man. Number um, two. Number two, uh, so number one, have a strategy. Um, number two, for agency owners, I would say there's, there's, there's a lot of talk going on currently about niching down, having a certain kind of product service, uh, a certain kind of industry you focus on. Uh, I would say that one of the things that I see as a big limiting factor is people niche down 100%. They're almost married to an industry. Absolutely. Mm. I'm going to do e-commerce. I'm going to do hospitality, whatever that might be. Um, and when a pandemic hits like this, for example, and if you're in the hospitality space, you're dead. <laughs> like y y y your whole industry is going down there's no amount of Facebook ads which is going to drag a billion pound industry up through the waters back to resurface and yep. if you've got nothing but hospitality clients like your neck is on the line big time I would say niching down doesn't mean to go 100% go 80% Mm. Right. Leave some room for yeah, to be flexible. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Twenty percent. Try other things. You might find that. Oh my God! Like you're amazing at e-commerce, and you didn't even realize. You might find that. Oh well, actually, um, my local florists have a really good network, and they can refer me to other people because there's no no one focusing on that area. Whatever that might be. Um, so I would say number two, don't niche down one hundred percent. Leave room to try other things. So good. Number three. Number three, I would say, um, I would I, I would say be resourceful. Mm. Be resourceful. So being resourceful doesn't just mean getting the most out of your ads. You spend a certain amount. You want to get the most out of them. Um, what are you doing to get the most out of your team? What are you doing to get the most out of your systems? What are you doing to get the most out of your processes? What are you doing to get the most out of yourself? Are you holding yourself accountable? To what degree? Um, as long as we're resourceful, that's really and truly the essence of a successful marketer, I would say. Mm. Um, it would be useless for me to say something like, read. Do you know what I mean? Which a lot of people mm. have said in, in these kinds of formats. I would suggest people read. A, a lot of people will either read or won't read, but regardless of that, they will have enormous amounts of success. Mm. I don't know anyone to this day who has being extremely successful without being resourceful. Mm. It's almost a prerequisite, which is why I'd say that's such an important one. Amazing, bro, 100%. All right, guys, dude, thank you thank for you. coming on here. Really glad we could do this interview. Um, I'm gonna leave a link to Saf's Instagram uh, in the description if you wanna reach out to him personally, um, just to kind of pick his brain a bit more and just learn more about him and his agency. Um, also guys, again, like this video, more importantly, subscribe to the channel by hitting the subscribe button below and turn on post notifications so that you don't miss out on more amazing, helpful, valuable content just like these interviews, client successes that we do, and more uh, how-to videos and trainings here on this channel. And again, a few links in the description, our free Facebook group, and multiple trainings that we have here on YouTube. With that said, see you guys in the next video. Peace. Back on deck on my fly. Back. Uh, really on, really on my. Uh, really on. Pay some respect to my mindset. Hair hey, uh, blowing smoke, catch a contact. Really mad they can't stop us. Back on the scene, unconscious. Uh,